Well, good evening. Uh, I am Tim Wallach. I'm a trustee of this glorious library. I wish in full disclosure to state that I was a student of then Professor Ginsburg at Columbia Law School just before she was appointed to the DC Circuit Court. When I knew her, no one said in the hallways, you Ruth Bader, believe it. No three goats were brought to campus as they recently were to the state capitol in Vermont to eat the spreading poison ivy and duly named Ruth Bader and Ginsburg. <laughs> How did this happen? Professor DeHart, in her excellent book, undertook a 15-year project relying on published materials, public records, and extensive interviews. But I find it amazing in light of the recent Kavanaugh hearings to consider the following. In 1993, 20 years after Roe v. Wade became the law of the land, Judge Ginsburg, in a major speech as a judge on the circuit court, cited Roe v. Wade as a case with, quote, doctrinal limbs too swiftly shaped, which experience teaches may prove unstable. Mm -hmm. Many feminists were absolutely appalled. When Bill Clinton was contemplating a little later, just a few months later, that same year, who to replace retiring Justice Byron White to be the first justice appointed by a Democrat since 1967, mm -hmm. Ginsburg was not on any of the lists sent to the White House by women's groups. It was Senator Patrick Moynihan who suggested Ginsburg to the president. But the president replied, the women are all against her. Indeed, in a letter to the White House, the National Women's Law Center, the Women's Legal Defense Fund, and NOW's Legal Defense and Education Fund, on whose board Ginsburg had served, stated, it has been reported that the women's movement would oppose the nomination of Judge Bader, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. At this stage, we have not taken any position in favor or against her being a candidate. Not for ringing endorsement. <laughs> and yet, three weeks later, she was nominated. Jane DeHart has written on the 20th century U.S. history and U.S. women's history. She was a professor at the University of North Carolina and at the University of California in Santa Barbara. I turn the lectern to Pre Professor DeHart to help us better understand this icon. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be in this venerable library. And I'm delighted that you made it possible. Um, I'm going to answer your question about that. But first, I just want to do, um, I want to show you, I want to uh, talk very briefly uh, about the formative influences on Ginsburg, because I think most of us, or many of you know her as a law professor or as a judge and justice, but uh, not as much is known about her early life. And I want particularly to talk about, this is Ruth the two, and I want particularly to talk about her mother because C. Bader was a formidable influence. Uh, Ruth was the second of two daughters born in the middle of the Depression. And the older, her older sister died when Ruth was two of spinal meningitis. And this formidable woman, and I said, poured all of this energy into this child that remained, and she was very determined that this little girl was going to be bright, was going to be endowed with Jewish history, and was going to learn the meaning of what it meant to be a lady. Now, for Celia, 
it not, did not mean just um, being polite, refraining from sex before marriage, but it meant controlling what it meant self-discipline, it meant controlling one's anger, not expect, anger she taught her was very unproductive. And it meant holding on to one's values and principles and defending them when you needed to. So, um, this is a, uh, Ruth's mother uh, and her sister married um, the, the uh, Bayer brothers. So this is a double cousin. And Ruth, they lived in, they lived during the Depression in the same, shared the same apartment. And then later moved into uh, separate uh, facilities. I want to flash forward. <laughs> Um, to Ruth's years at Cornell and the people who really influenced her. She studied literature with Nabokov and was fascinated by his emphasis on words and word choice. And she did, but she, and I think she would have been a literature major, major if she had not felt that the, this was, she'd never be able to support herself. Because her mother had actually saved money. Uh, she, it was a very modest family. And her mother had actually saved money so she wouldn't have to go to a subway school. Uh, she could go to major university. And her after Ruth's mother died uh, two days before she graduated from high school, and she had had cancer the entire time Ruth was in high school. And uh, her father's business failed almost immediately, and she gave the money that her mother had saved uh, to her father. And when she went to Cornell. She had a scholarship, but she also needed to make extra money. So she decided she would major in government. And this was the heyday, not only of the feminine mystique, but of the McCarthy era. And one of the most influential professors she had was Robert Cushman, who's on the left, that's now the top at the top. And she studied constitutional law under him. And one of, and she was also his research assistant. And he put her to work um, reading uh, anti-communist tracts and red channels, which she read as devoutly as if she'd been on the, the, the attorney general's list. And he emphasized how important it was for people who were accused by um, HUAC, House on American Activities, how important it was to have lawyers who defended them. She also studied under um, Milton Convitz, who taught an American Ideals course at Cornell. Uh, he was the son of a rabbi uh, and taught a course on the Constitution and American ideas and values. She was totally intimidated by him, never dared. He was an extremely learned man. He was also something of an activist because he had uh, worked with uh, NAACP uh, and on a series of things. And one of Convitz's role was engaging students in current issues and getting them 
thinking about them in the context of the Constitution. And he convinced, he was very, also very good at helping students think about the issues and what role they might play. So by the time she was a sophomore in college, she had decided that she would like to be a lawyer and uh, uh, took the SATs, I mean the LSATs, <coughs> and was accepted to Harvard Law School. Uh, very shortly after they began accepting women. <laughs> she also at Cornell met the love of her life, Marty Ginsburg, who along with her mother was I think her greatest enabler. When she arrived at Harvard Law School, uh, Marty had, was a year ahead of her and he had had to uh, it was tail end of the Korean War, and he had been on ROTC. So he, after, as soon as uh, he graduated, he was sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And because he was a great golfer, uh, he'd been on the golf team at Cornell, he was assigned to teach uh, to the artillery school. And there's a wonderful account uh, in, I guess it's the third chapter, second or third chapter, about their life at Fort Sill. And when they came back and to Harvard Law School, she was a mother with a 14-month-old baby. And Marty said, she's gonna make the law review. And people looked at her very skeptically. He was a woman, a woman with a baby, and she certainly was very, very young looking, very feminine, and they just shook their heads. But of course, she did make the law review. And you uh, can see her right here. <laughs> Uh, Harvard Law School then was really male turf. Uh, one of the things that uh, would happen is that um, there were some law professors who were not at all happy about having um, women in the class and would hold ladies' day. Uh, they would ignore them the rest of the year and call on them on ladies' day when it was a case that involved rape or something like that. And the men would apparently stomp, and uh, it was not pleasant. Ruth never had to go through that, but she said she always felt she had to be impeccably prepared because there were so few women, and they stood out so clearly. Um, Marty developed testicular cancer his third year at Harvard Law School, and uh, almost died. And at that time, Ruth, who had this child, they had this child, and Ruth had his classmates, this is back in the days of carbon paper, take notes in all his classes, and would take the uh, carbon to, to Marty, and typed all of his papers, and developed a schedule for which she is notorious. And of course she had her own uh, duties on the law school and her own classes to attend. And she said uh, that there were nights when she never really went to sleep. And so she's developed this pattern of clerks are not at all surprised to get uh, messages from her at two, three, four or five, six in the morning, and her son would get, would get up, uh, oh, sometime around five or six, uh, to go to the bathroom and find his mother still sitting at the dining room table with a cup of coffee, cold coffee, and her books.
when she graduated, uh, at Harvard, Harvard Law School dean at that time, I mean, after Marty's illness, uh, and he was a year ahead of her, and there was no job in Boston that for him to take while she finished. Um, and she was very reluctant to leave him after having nearly lost him to cancer. So she went into the Dean of Harvard Law School and asked if she could take her senior year at Columbia. And he said no, though according to other people, men were allowed to do that. So she transferred to Columbia, graduated, tied the first in her class, a member of the Columbia Law Review, and she could not get now, this is not unusual. Sandra Day O'Connor went to Stanford Law School, was third in her class, Red was first, and Sandra Day O'Connor could not get a job. So, um, law was not a friendly place for women. Um, but she got a job, she got a job through at Columbia on a, her specialty was civil procedure. She got, and nobody, uh, and they were doing a comparative civil procedure. Everybody, of course, wanted to do France or um, Britain or whatever. Nobody wanted to learn Swedish. <laughs> and Hans Smith, who uh, was a professor at Columbia and quite fond of, of Ruth, who at that point was very shy and really lacked confidence after this job search, asked her if she was interested in learning Swedish and doing a, compar a book on comparative civil <coughs> procedure in Sweden. And she did. And turned it, uh, she had, she had, one of her Columbia Law professors had, nobody wanted to hire her as a clerk either because she had this child. And one of her Columbia Law professors, uh, after having done a round, a round of judges at Foley Square, um, told one of the judges, Judge Palmieri, that if he refused to meet with Ginsburg, he would never recommend another law student. Palmieri relented, and Ruth apparently was the only clerk he ever had who learned how to read his writing. <laughs> <laughs> and he was absolutely devoted to her. And One of her professors at, at Harvard um, wrote to Frank Bricker, who had hired an African-American clerk, and said, would you consider she's absolutely as capable as any student I've ever recommended to you. And she's beautifully dressed. She doesn't wear pants, which Frank Bricker's totally disliked. And he said no. So she came back from Sweden, and Rutgers at York had lost its civil procedure uh, professor, who was African American, and Ruth got the job. It was one other woman at, at, um, on the faculty at Rutgers. And initially, she was not a terribly good teacher in that she was very serious about her subject and not very dynamic. 
um, as Eva, Eva Hanks, who was her colleague, said, in the beginning she would just cling to the, the, the lectern. <coughs> but she was so skilled at what she talked about and so intense that the students, this is a photograph of the students at Rutgers, at Rutgers Law School at Newark always did a skit making fun of them, their professors. And here she is, their caricature of Ruth was that she would stand up holding onto the lectern and the student who was making fun of her record, she was intensely lecturing and the student kept undressing and Eva Hanks said it was a terrible taste but she smiled gaily here and when she was at Rutgers, this was during the women's movement, and students asked her to teach a course on women in the law. It was a uh, gender discrimination course. She had, she agreed to do it. And she also was inter uh, agreed to volunteer once she became a full professor uh, to the local New York ACLU. And they thought, well, she would certainly know something about civil procedure. And she was a woman. And they had all these cases that um, involved women. Um, women who wanted to teach after the, they were, became pregnant and were forced to resign. Uh, just a slew of cases. And Ruth agreed to take them and did a very good job. Um, she knew very little about the national ACLU and very little about her predecessors on the board. And these include, there were really a troika of women on the ACLU board. Um, Dorothy Kenyon, uh, Holly Murray and Harriet Pilpel. Harriet Pilpel had been was a leader, moved the board on um, abortion reform. She was a lawyer, uh, brilliant lawyer for Planned Parenthood. And Holly Murray, who now has a building named after her Yale Law School had written, she had worked with Charles Hampton um, in the uh, um, <clears throat> Legal Defense Fund. What? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. And had written this article on Jane Crow because she thought that you could probably apply the Equal Protection Clause to women if you could get the court to recognize the analogy between race and sex, racial and sex discrimination. Arne Ayer was head of the national um, ACLU and was a very enterprising young president who, and a Holocaust victim, um, who decided that the ACLU had been very much involved in civil rights legislation, had a civil rights project. So, why not have a women's rights project? And Ruth had, the ACLU was looking for a test case at least its general counsels uh, uh, were, and in which they could get the court for the first time to recognize uh, 
gender discrimination. And Ruth found out that they were doing this, that they were, uh, that they were doing this case. And she offered to write the brief. And it was a brief in Read v. Read. Which was one of her really a brilliant brief. And when the court decided that this Idaho law discriminating against men and women as executors um, was, could not be justified on grounds of administrative uh, convenience, the ACLU knew it had a precedent that they could build on and asked Ruth, who had had no experience as a litigator, to take on the job. Uh, Norman Dorson was the, the general counsel, and she had, she was very clever. Uh, she had, uh, she, she had known uh, Dorson at Harvard Law School. And uh, as, when I remember interviewing him, he said, she still was raw with discrimination, but she really had fire in the belly. And she was chosen to develop the, the litigative strategy and argue these series of cases for which she won all but one. And it was a case she just hated, the uh, ACLU, local uh, branches, was, if they appealed the case to the Supreme Court, they were supposed to get permission. And this was a case in which it had slipped by. And it was a case of re reverse discrimination. A man in Florida challenging uh, a case that favored uh, widows. And that was the only case she lost. She's a great admirer of Marshall's litigation strategy and adopted it. Now, I'm going to flash forward. By the 19, in the 1970s, um, American politics, Reagan, of course, was elected in 80. And there was already evidence of backlash on the court involving uh, racial issues and she realized that she was not going to get what she wanted which was street scrutiny that is the judges would have to take and the justices would have to take as hard as close a look at cases discriminating against women as they did cases discriminating on the basis of race so when Carter was um, president, there was an omnibus judgeship bill uh, passed to increase the number of, based on merit, to increase the number of female and African American justices. Ruth applied for the Second Circuit. She was turned down. She applied for the DC Circuit and was not really considered by the um, Attorney General because they were accustomed to recruiting uh, courses, uh, uh, justice, uh, judges for the federal bench from large law firms, which of course neither African Americans usually or women had access to. Some did, but Ruth was considered too liberal because she had, was a feminist and she had represented the ACLU. She finally uh, did get the appointment. And as an appeals court judge, did something that her colleague on the appeals court did, uh, 
Patricia Wall, who had been public interest lawyer uh, before Carter appointed her as a legis legislative liaison uh, to the court. And Patricia Wall said, that sanitized my do-gooder reputation. Ruth felt she had, she needed to do that when she was appointed to the circuit court. And she built a reputation as a very fair and conscientious judge, but one who did not test the boundaries in terms of the Supreme Court. As the court became, uh, as the D.C. Court of Appeals became, which had been considered very liberal, became more conservative with, uh, in the Reagan and Bush years, Ruth was noted for her ability to forge friendships across uh, political lines. She and Scalia were absolutely great friends. And I can remember going to the, her dedicate, to the dedication of her portrait at the Supreme Court. And it was held at, at the DC Circuit Court. And all the Supreme Court members were in their street clothes over on one side. The clerks were ranged in the front. The first person to speak was Scalia. And he began by saying, now I know you don't expect me to be here paying tribute to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and she's never gonna make a feminist out of me. <laughs> but, pause, and just the most charming speech I have ever heard. Uh, and then there were others that followed, but Scalia really outdrew them all. And, uh, um, a lot of people have asked why they were such good friends. Because neither was going to convert to each other, but they loved sparring. So much so that Rehnquist, who ran a very tight court, would despair because they always walked in talking to, uh, uh, for conference. And he wanted to run things. A conference is, is when, the, after the justices have heard a case, and they meet with no one else present to cast their votes. And I think one of the keys to their friendship was that Ruth is a, basically a very serious person. Barney, on the other hand, her husband was not. He was extremely witty, very outgoing. And Scalia would make her laugh to the point she said that he would say things sotto voce uh, on the court. And I can remember going, I had Marty Steed at one point, and I could hear Scalia say, Oh, when she asked a question, oh, she's going to try to bait him out. <laughs> <laughs> but he would say things that would make her laugh so hard, she would have to pinch herself. And she said she would pinch herself so hard to keep from laughing that she literally would have bruises on her arms. <laughs> and they had a wonderful friendship. So someone asked me at a previous book signing, if I, if I thought it was possible to develop that friendship with Kavanaugh, and I said, it really depends on whether he has a sense of humor, because that's, he would, they, they also, she and Scalia also shared a love of good writing, and she would get, the Supreme Court justices don't do much talking together. I mean, they have lunch together, but there are only certain topics they talk about and don't talk about cases. Uh, the, the, you really find out uh, what 
people think when uh, uh, an opinion is assigned and drafts are circulated. And she and Scalia, when they were on the opposite side, would write to the other and, and say, wouldn't it be a better choice of words to use this rather than that? Because they both cared so much about craftsmanship. Plus they had a shared love of opera. And I think really, as, and I know this may sound strange about the, to say about Ginsburg, but really a shared zest for life. This was, um, this is her daughter Jane, her son, um, and her grandchildren, um, uh, Jane's two children. This little girl, Clara, is now the third generation of Ginsburg women to graduate from Harvard Law School. Mm -hmm. And she's now clerking on the Second Circuit. <laughs> Ruth's punny, um, this is uh, diversion, but Ruth's way of punishing her children for an infraction was to make them write an essay and to rewrite it and rewrite it until it was perfect. Interesting thing is that James Ginsburg here, who is her daughter and is a professor of intellectual property uh, at Columbia University, <coughs> use the same method with her children. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I really enjoyed in writing the book was to see how Ruth replicated her own mother's mothering. Her mother was very strict, very loving, but very strict. And how Jane has replicated this with her children. When Clinton appointed Ruth to the Supreme Court, she had a, a reputation on the D.C. Court of Appeals as being a very moderate judge and one who could bridge political divisions. Her collegiality was notable. And she was not Clinton's first choice. I'm going to go back into your point about uh, the feminist opposition to her because she had had tremendous support uh, on the, when she was appointed to the D.C. Court of, of Appeals. But after White died and Clinton was looking for possible judges, Ruth's name was not high on the list. First, she was 60 and he wanted someone who would outlive Clarence Thomas, which, um, and when he, at, he asked um, Senator Monaghan on the flight to do or who he would suggest, and Monaghan said, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Clinton said, the women are against her. Now, why? I think it has to do in part with the fact that on the DC, Ruth was much better known, Ginsburg was much better known to the public during her years as a litigator. And 13 years on the DC circuit, a lot had happened in the Bush in the, uh, in the um, Reagan-Bush administration that put women's rights very much on the black back burner. And for women's organizations that were in the trenches, Ginsburg seemed very remote those 13 years from the, of the, the district. 
for it. And she had a reputation as a very moderate judge. And even feminist legal scholars had moved on. That is, they felt that uh, they were very critical, the feminist legal scholars were very critical of the fact that women's legal equality had not accomplish more. Now, this is not because it's Ruth Black vision, but because she could get, she got what the court granted. And, was, and it was not always what she asked for. Uh, certainly did not go as far as she wanted it to. And so there was a, a, a lot of feminist literature moved on with people like um, to um, critiques of what's known as legal feminism and became much more concerned, concerned with issues of sexual violence. Catherine McKinnon, who was a uh, major legal scholar, uh, actually pioneered um, sexual, her, her work actually pioneered mm -hmm. sexual harassment law. And I think Ruth just seemed old fashioned to them. Marty, on the other hand, <coughs> knew that his wife was not going to campaign. Ruth was so painfully modest that Ari Nair, who's head of the ACLU, asked her to run for the board and got so frustrated because she would talk about her cases. She would never talk about herself. And his comment was that when she was elected, it was one of the rare act, uh, elected, it was one of the rare acts of wisdom on the part of the voters. And Marty knew that she was much less visible than she had been previously. So he floated uh, a balloon with some of the organizations that had supported her for the DC court, and the balloon sank. So he then turned, he then turned to um, people who he thought in the legal community would support her. And he ran an incredible campaign to advance her name. Uh, it came down ultimately, ultimately to uh, uh, Ginsburg and Breyer. Clinton had initially wanted to appoint Como, and Como wasn't interested. Uh, he then had another possibility, who was Bruce Babbitt, who was Secretary of the Interior. And uh, Democrats said, he's one of the few Democratic uh, people we have in the West. And Orrin Hatch said, we, who's obviously a Republican on the Judiciary Committee, said, Babbitt's not going to fly. So, the choice was down to Ginsburg and um, oh, like Breyer. 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 Ginsburg and Breyer. And Breyer had had a bicycle and had had a bicycle accident when he was, uh, was in the hospital, when he was interviewed by people from the White House. And he had to, he couldn't fly. He had some cracked ribs, and he had to come by train. And he had a social security problem. And the Clinton had uh, Clinton administration had had enough social security problems hmm. with women they had tried to appoint as attorney general. Ruth, on the other hand, 
And it was interesting because the White House thought that it was because Marty was a tax lawyer and he had done the taxes. But it was Ruth who did uh, play the Social Security, did, I guess, household accounts and had paid Social Security. And when Clinton interviewed her, he was absolutely wow. I mean, this is a woman who can really form when the stakes are high. And he had wanted to appoint a justice who could knock it out of the ballpark. And he thought he had, when he was called to the she was called to the White House. It was supposed to be for a 30 minute conversation. It turned out to be 90 minutes. And Clinton felt he had his candidate. She would, she had a reputation as a moderate judge and a collegial judge and one who he knew would stand up for it to the majority when she needed to. And it's, it's really interesting because on the Rehnquist court, she played a very moderate role and was very close to Senator Day O'Connor. And ultimately, Rehnquist, who when she was litigator, had very seldom voted for her, wrote the opinion in the Family and Medical Leave Act, uh, a test of the Family and Medical Leave Act. <coughs> and when I was interviewed Ruth after that, I said, did you ghostwrite that? <coughs> and she said, that is exactly what Marty asked me. So she obviously could be very persuasive. But then with O'Connor gone, that is isn't me. <laughs> if it is, well, it will stop. Um, I hope. Um, when Rehnquist died, when O'Connor retired and Rehnquist died, and George W. Bush appointed Roberts and Alito, she knew very quickly that they were not on the same uh, issue in connection with race. And Ruth, as, uh, as a justice, Ruth's vision of, of equality became very capacious. And she just was tired of, of trying to accommodate them. And she really became best known for dissents that were no longer as well, they weren't Scalia-like, but they were very, became very pointed on issues like uh, partial birth abortion, um, Lily Ledbetter, equal pay. And it's to her dissents that attracted the attention, her dissent on voting rights, in which she said, it's like, of Roberts uh, and the majority. It's like throwing out your umbrella in the midst of a rainstorm. <laughs> and there was a young student at NYU Law School who picked this up and created the notorious RBG website. <laughs> and what is fascinating is the articles that are for sale. And Ruth that Ginsburg suddenly became a celebrity, hmm. which is very unusual for Supreme Court justices. Hmm. Uh, her clerks discovered the website, told her what it was about. Her grandchildren delighted in it, 
and she wears, she ordered a supply of notorious RBG t-shirts, one of which she gave to uh, uh, Nina Totenberg. And what I think is impressive, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, is how she uses her celebrity. Because when Ruth was a child, her mother was a great admirer of Eleanor Roosevelt, and how Eleanor Roosevelt used her position for the marginalized. And Ruth has used her, for the most part, I think, used her notoriety to promote values that she holds dear. So on that note, I'll end, and I'm certainly open for questions. Uh, 
feminist lawyers had two devices for getting the court to finally recognize sex discrimination. One of them was passage of an equal rights amendment, and I had written a book on that. And I was dumb enough to think that I could write a book on the other prong of this without having gone to law school. <laughs> um, so that's one reason it took so long, because I knew that Ginsburg would ultimately read this. And I had to have it impeccable in terms of discussion of the cases. And also, I live in California. And California wildfires are a hazard of living there. And I lost my house along the, the way and everything in it, which included all my research. So it took a long time. And I had an editor, a marvelous editor, who would say every year, well, you have to cover the next term. You have to cover the next term. And finally, I thought, my gosh, I'm going to, I'm no spring chicken. And I am, Ginsburg is going to outlive me. Uh, but um, it, it worked out very well, I think, the time we did. Could you talk a little bit about the, um, the legal cases that she brought for women? Because I think it's important to remember that the feminist movement is actually very large and very diverse. And perhaps some of the militant feminists were not supportive of her. But there were many other women who knew the cases that she brought and were actually very supportive of her. So if you could just talk a little bit about her contributions to the laws that were so significant for women because they're really impressive. Well, the first. Can you use the mic, please? Yes, thank you. Um, the first case she took had to do with a tax issue, and it was to try out her argument. Uh, her husband, Marty, came into her office and said, Ruth, you have to read this. And it was a tax case involving a man who had, uh, was not married and had tried to deduct the expenses of caring for his ailing mother. And the IRS had said, no, women could do this, but men could not. Huh. So um, um, Barty and Ruth wrote the brief, um, wrote the brief, argued the case. And the interesting, one of the interesting things about it, uh, and one, and that was, that was the start of the litigation. And she had a lot to go up against because she was attacking stereotypes in the law that seemed to some of the justices to be absolutely common sensical that men were providers, uh, that women who were, were, insign were insignificant. And Ruth had no problem at all about using male plaintiffs, that is, men who had been discriminated against. And one of her famous cases was the Weisenfeld case. And um, well, when she decided what cases she was going to take, she thought particularly about Social Security cases. Because when Social Security was devised, it, it was clearly devised for a male breadwinner family. 
And of course, that had changed. That had begun to change. And there were social security laws that she found absolutely indefensible. And one of these was a case. This young man, Jason Weisenfeld, uh, was very skilled computer technician. And his wife, Paula Weisenfeld, was working for the PhD in education. And she was going to be the stable breadwinner. And she died in childbirth. And he wanted to stay home and take care of the baby because he could not find somebody that he felt comfortable with. And when he applied for widower's benefits, he was told they only applied to widows. And he wrote an article in the New Brunswick paper that said, tell that to Gloria Steinem. Mm -hmm. And a colleague of uh, Booth at uh, Rutgers sent it to her. And she wrote to Weidenfeld and said, I'll be glad to take your case. We'll have to first argue it in the lower courts. And that was hard because they could not believe anyone who had the number of degrees that uh, Weisenfeld had would become, would give up his job to take care of a baby. And she had a very hard time persuading the court to do that. And Rehnquist later asked her, uh, and, and uh, Stephen Weisenfeld, unknown to Ruth, gave up his lucrative computing job at, during, it was during the oil strike, and sold bicycles mm -hmm. in New Brunswick so he would come nearer meeting the economic circumstances that would help persuade uh, would help further Ruth's case. And as is typical, they became fast friends. Uh, when I first met Ruth, I was told by a friend who knew the Ginsburgs, Ruth doesn't do small talk. Mm -hmm. So when I first met her, I had been reading uh, case files, and I was introduced to her at the Supreme Court uh, reception, and I started talking about the Weisenfeld case, and her face lit up, and she said, oh, I'll put you in touch with, with Stephen. And when I couldn't, the New York Times had a fantastic photograph on the front page of Stephen and Jason when she won the case, and they had lost it. Hmm. And so I wrote to Stephen Weisenfeld, and he sent me, this was a picture from a local paper. But she has a great capacity for, though well, this is not, getting at your other cases. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the Weisenfeld case was a very important case. Um, I think her Social Security cases, the Goldfarb case, uh, in which um, women who had worked were not entitled to their husbands, surviving husbands, were not entitled to their um, social security pensions if they had not um, been a major breadwinner. And Ruth took this case and made it all about Goldfarb's wife and how she was being penalized. <laughs> Uh, because she had always worked. 
And I think that, that was an important case. Um, so, she made the, she sometimes took cases in which men were plaintiffs, but she would emphasize the injustice that was, the gender injustice that was involved. And she also, initially, deliberately took men as plaintiffs because she thought it was a way of convincing the justices of the gender inequity involved. It also fit her definition. When she was in Sweden um, doing this research on comparative civil procedure, Swedish feminism was an interesting point. And she read Swedish and she read the debates in the Swedish newspaper about the initial effort in Sweden had been to get women into the workforce on equal terms. And there was a debate at the time Ruth was in Sweden by a columnist named Eva Moberg about why should it be about getting women into uh, the workforce? Because just that. It was a Swedish word, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Janet's type, which was about being fully human and that both partners should enjoy both the responsibilities and the pleasures of work and family. And it profoundly affected Ruth's vision of what equality was all about. And she was at a dinner one time and a man said to her something about women's lib. And she said, it's not about women's lib. It's about human liberation. And she believes that very strongly. I remember going to her chambers at one point and surrounded by legal books with photographs in front, um, opera singers, whatever. Um, and Ruth does nothing that isn't undeliberate. And I remember her showing me photographs. And it was her son-in-law <coughs> taking care of their first son. And she said, this is the way it ought to be. <laughs> and she, I think one of the things that I really <coughs> enjoyed discovering was how capacious her vision of equal justice is. <coughs> men and women be able to be, in Swedish terms, fully human.